Hello everyone. So today we will discuss module 2 lesson 2 and this lesson is all about shapes, plane and space. So these are also the basic um, elements of art. What is a shape? So a shape is defined as an enclosed area in two dimensions. So by definition, shapes are always implied and flat in nature. So basically, we can see different shapes around us. So everything that we see around us are formed by shapes. So they can be created in many ways. And the simplest one is by enclosing our, an area with an outline. So for example, the simple shapes like triangle, circle, square, um, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, octagon, nonagon. So those are examples of shapes. And shapes can also be made by surrounding, surrounding an area with other shapes. So for example, in this picture, so we have here um, rectangle on the outside and square and in, in the inside, they are also, or we also have another form of shape like this one. So we also have square inside, right? Or this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven sides. This is, yeah, heptagon. So we have heptagon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven heptagon on the outside. And we can also make one big heptagon inside. All right. So this is also um, how we can see shapes. Okay, so shapes animate figure ground relationships and we visually determine the positive and the negative shapes. So when we say positive shapes, they are usually the figure, the figure itself, and the negative shapes is the ground or yeah, refers to the ground. So let's say for example for your hand. So just open your head, guys, okay, and spread your fingers apart. So your hand itself, so your hand is actually the positive shape okay so this is the figure and the space around it so the space around your hand is the negative shape so it, this is the ground okay so this is how we see the positive and negative shape Next is plane. So plane is defined as any surface area in space. So in two-dimensional art, the picture plane is the flat surface an image is created upon. So for example, the piece of paper, stretch canvas, and the wood panel. So the space right there refers to the plane. So let's take a look on the shape planes. So a shape's orientation within the picture plane creates a visually implied plane. So yeah, it infers the direction and depth in relation to the viewer. So let's say for example, this one. So we have the circle, but uh, it has different shapes. So, and it also tells us um, the plane right there or the surface. So tells us or creates a visually implied plane. So let's say, for example, in this circle, so we're looking um, at the circle at the front. And this circle may be kind of slanting, okay, and this one also. So it means we are looking on it on the other side. Next is we have space. So space is the empty area surrounding a real or implied objects. So humans categorize the space. For example, we have the outer space, okay? So that limitless void we enter beyond our sky. We also have the inner space, is inner space which resides in our minds and imaginations. And personal space, the important but intangible area that surrounds each individual and which is violated if someone else gets too close. So those are the types of space that human usually categorize. An outer space, the inner space in our mind and imagination, and personal space. When it comes to art or with consideration to drawings and paintings, our goal is to create the illusion of space. Okay, so clearly artists are as concerned with space in their works as they are with, say, color or form. So, for example, in this picture, 
Okay, so we can see the different sizes of the objects. So objects that are smaller will appear far, further away from the viewer. So like this one. So we can um, imagine that because the space provided for this um, for this circle is like this one. So we can imagine that this circle is too far. This one, and this is the near circle, nearer circle, no, nearest, I'm sorry, nearest circle, followed by the next one and the farthest circle. Okay. All right, now let's proceed to the different types of perspectives. So we'll start from the one point perspective. So one point perspective occurs when the recording, uh, I'm sorry, with the, when the receding lines appear to converge or meet at a single point on the horizon and used when the flat front of an object is facing the viewer. So for example, in this one, this circle, Okay, I'm sorry, this um, box, okay, this box is showing us an example of a one-point perspective. So we can see here the flat front of the object. So this one, this is the box, the flat front of the box, this one. Okay, so this is the one-point perspective. So the viewer will see the box this way. So if we're going to apply that in a painting, so this is an example. So this is the classic Renaissance artwork by Leonardo da Vinci. So this is The Last Supper, okay, from 1498, yes. So here, da Vinci composes the work by locating the vanishing point directly behind the head of Christ. So this one. So thus drawing the viewer's attention to the center. So when we look at the painting, the first thing that most viewers can observe is this one, okay? The thing or the vanishing point behind Jesus, okay? So his arms mirror the receding wall, okay, this one. And if we follow them as lines, it would converge at the same vanishing point. So it's like it's creating as an illusion that, yeah, so we are, we have here um, Jesus at the center and the illusion of uh, the vanishing point at the back. So it seems like um, the place or this one is kind of far, okay, and also it creates or um, the point here is that we can see at the center. Okay, so just like that. So this is the one point perspective. So the viewer's attention is at the center. So we also have the two point perspective. So two point perspective appears or occurs when the vertical edge of a cube is facing the viewer. Okay, so the vertical edge of a cube is facing the viewer, exposing the two sides that recede into the distance, one to each vanishing point. So like this example, so this is the two point perspective. Okay, so, or this one, let's look at this box or this cube. All right, so we are looking at two um, parts of the box or two parts of the cube. So if so one point perspective, we only see the one side or one side of the cube. So two point perspective, we can see two face the uh, two and uh, not two parts. Okay, or two sides of the cube. So like this one. So we can see this side on the right and the other one on the left. And the last one is the three-point perspective. So it is used when an artist wants to, wants to project a bird's eye view. That is when the projection lines recede to two points on the horizon and a, th and a third either far above or below the horizon line. So for example, in this picture, okay, so this is the um, example of three-point perspective. Okay, so with vanishing points above and below the horizon. Okay, so in this case, the parallel lines, okay, the lines that we see here, 
okay, that make up the side of an object are actually not parallel to the edge of the ground. So the artist uh, that the artist is working on. So like this one. So you can observe that this part here at the top is wider compared to the bottom because we have the perspective of like um, an object that is um, yeah it's like a bird's eye view so if you are at the top so this is how you see things so that's why ganito yung perspective niya so we have um, we have smaller sides um, edge at the bottom and wider at the top because this is how we see it at the top like a like a bird so this is the three point perspective in addition guys the perspective system is a cultural convention well suited to a traditional western europe ide european idea of the truth that is an accurate clear rendition of the observed reality so for using those perspective guys even if it is just a two-dimensional art or drawing but it can um give us um it can give us a clear rendition of observed reality so it means it feels like real okay so even after the invention of linear perspective many cultures traditionally use a flatter pictorial space relying on the overlapped shapes or size differences in forms to indicate the same truth of observation so in the past um, artists or people just draw linear perspective for example if you draw a square you just draw a, a box or a square so you will just draw like that but um, using those different perspectives so we can create an image of how the box is actually situated in real life so this is this will give us um, a clearer um, observation of the reality Alright, so after nearly about 500 years using the linear perspective, so the Western ideas and and um, the Western ideas about how space is depicted actually accurately in two dimensions went through a revolution at the beginning of the 20th century. So that is where Pablo Picasso so went to Paris and he reinvented the pictorial space with the invention of Cubism. So, as we all know, guys, as uh, we have discussed in our previous lesson, so Pablo Picasso invented Cubism. So, he showed that or he showed the image of Cubism in his painting entitled Les Demoiselles uh, de d'Avenon in 1907. So, this is an image of women. Okay. So, as you can see, um, yeah, so the lines I kind of are kind of pointed and the colors are kind of um, exaggerated. So this is the image. Okay, so this is the first um, painting wherein he showed us cubism. So he was influenced in part by the chiseled forms, angular surfaces, and this proportion of African sculpture. So this is called the Cameroon sculpture. But uh, yes, so this is the male figure from Cameroon and mask-like faces of the early Iberian artwork. So this is these are the sculptures, guys, entitled Cameroon. So an image of man. So this is where Pablo Picasso has um, get his influence to create cubism. So that's how we see it on his paintings. So as the cubist style developed, it for its forms became even flatter. So this is an example. We have the one. Um, this is one Grises, the sun blind, okay, from 1914. This place the still life it represents across the canvas. So as you can see here, yeah, so this is the image itself. The so collage elements like newspapers reinforce pictorial flatness. So this is just a drawing, but you can still see the emotion or the direction here. So it's like the paper or the newspaper was um, 
torn or was folded. Okay, so this is created in Canvas. The so value is the relative lightness or darkness of a shape in relation relation to another. So the value scale bounded on one end by pure white and on the other by black. And in between, a series of progressively darker shades of gray. So it gives an artist the tools to make these transformations. So this is um, where the shading usually comes in so we can see the um we can see the transformation of the shape or we can see more texture of the shape by adding value to it so that is by adding the colors okay, from dark to light so the value scale below shows the standard variations in tones so values near the lighter end of the spectrum are termed high key and those on the darker end are low key so this is the um, value scale so from the light color or pure white until the black so we have the shades of gray so in two dimensions the use of value gives a shape the illusion of mass and lends the entire composition a sense of light and shadow so this is usually in the shadow forms so the two examples show the effect value has on changing a shape to a form so let's say for example so this is an example of a two dimension art so this is just a simple um drawing of what the shape looks like okay but in three dimension form so we will add now the value so like this one so there is you can observe so there is a proper shading so the shading at the darker side so this one's the darker side this the front one shows the lighter side and there is also shadow so it creates a more realistic image of how these shapes or things are situated. Okay, so this is uh, the, the, the use of value. Now let's try to apply it in paintings. So the use of high contrast, so high contrast refers to placing the lighter areas of value against much darker ones, creates a dramatic effect, and on the other hand, we have the low contrast, which gives more subtle results. So let's see that here in this painting. So this one is um, a painting by Caravaggio. So it is entitled Gedita Decapitates Olofern in 1598. So as you can see here on the painting, Caravaggio uses a high contrast palette. Okay, how did he do that? So the background is really dark, as you can observe, right? And the, the subject of the painting or the people in the painting are in lighter areas or lighter color, lighter contrast. For example, this woman, this man, and this old man. So we can clearly uh, see their emotions. Okay, uh, we can clearly see the drama dramatic effect. Okay. And the background is too dark, okay, to give highlight or value to the main um, subjects. So, yeah, this is how we use high contrast or contrast in an art. And that's all for this topic. So, let me know if you have questions.